For well, my turnabout is the conclusion of Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney, Justice for All. It's widely considered to be one of the best cases in the entire series, but how good is it? In this video, we'll take a look at the case, and why I think it's just so damn good. The case opens at the Gatewater Imperial Hotel, the Chad version of the Gatewater Hotel from Turnabout Sisters, and we're here to see who wins the Hero of Heroes Grand Prix with our buddy, the former Steel Samurai, Will Powers. The Nickel Samurai, played by Matt on guard, wins over the Jam and Ninja, played by Juan Corrida. By the end of the evening, Maya ends up kidnapped, Juan Corrida murdered, and Matt on guard arrested for the crime. The kidnappers' demands? Get Matt on guard a not guilty verdict and Maya will be set free. Wright decides to tell Gumshoe, who tells him that he's probably screwed. The next morning, Pearl and Nick head to the detention center to talk to Matt on guard. On guard comes off as a bit of an airhead, definitely fitting the Hollywood stereotype the writers were going for. The most important thing about this part is when Nick uses the Magatama to ask him if he committed the murder. On guard says that he didn't, and no psycho locks appear, so on guard seems to be in the clear. Once Nick and company head over to the crime scene, things start to look pretty suspicious when it comes to on guard's manager, Adrian Andrews. We get a newspaper clipping that implies she was quite close with the victim, and there's a full wine glass in the room, which makes no sense considering the state of the rest of the room. It looks real bad for Andrews when Wright asks her what she knows and four Cyclops appear. The game wraps up the totally obvious Edgeworth death fake out as he returns when Wright gets to the police department. Edgeworth tells Phoenix that Andrews' mentor, who was also Juan Corrida's manager, had committed suicide. Corrida found the body, and suspiciously, Impax's suicide note was missing. Perhaps Adrian Andrews thought that Corrida killed Impax, and this was a revenge killing. At the start of the first trial, we learn that Francisca von Karma, who was supposed to be the prosecutor, was shot before the trial. Earlier, Maya's kidnapper, who identified himself as D Killer, mentioned that Nick would get a present for this trial, and Francisca's shooting was it. Gumshoe is the first testimony we hear, and immediately all the evidence points to the crime scene being tampered with. While it initially appears that Cordo was stabbed to death, the real COD was a strangulation via his bandana. Someone had stabbed the victim post-mortem. We also learned that said knife came from On Guard's room, which is a major reason why he was arrested to begin with. It looks more and more like someone is trying to frame our defendant. Skipping over a bit of a scare where it looks like we might lose, eventually Adrian Andrews is called to the stand. Her testimony section is pretty long, so here's the cliff notes of what we learn. Basically, Adrian Andrews is the only one who could have stabbed the victim, and she was most likely trying to frame Matt on guard. Her testimony is extremely questionable, and she'd probably be arrested for lying under oath, but that's literally every witness in these games ever. She ends up invoking her silence because things look so bad for her. It gets to the point that the judge is ready to hand down a not guilty verdict and arrest Andrews, but Edgeworth stops him and convinces Andrews to tell the truth. She had found the body and decided to tamper with the scene to frame on guard as she thought he must have been the killer. She put on a spared nickel samurai costume to not be seen by any witnesses. The judge buys this theory, and the trial is extended for another day. However, before things concluded, Edgeworth asked her about a card she'd been holding, and when he sees it, he flips out. Later, we learn what the card means. Edgeworth tells Wright that it's the calling card for an assassin known as Shelley DeKiller. Juan Corrida was murdered by him, and on guard ordered it. Wright then tells Edgeworth that Maya was kidnapped by a dude with a suspiciously similar sounding name, and Edgeworth agrees to try to save her. Not believing that his client is guilty, Phoenix goes to talk to him in the detention center. After breaking Cyclops that he got in this section, we see his true self, and he admits everything. But, uh, dude, the, the guard is right there. And uh, that's how this case ends. On guard is arrested and Maya dies, all due to Matt's own stupidity. Thanks for watching, guys. Just kidding, he probably paid the guard off or something, who knows. So anyways, On guard tells us that he hired to kill her, and he also filmed the crime taking place as insurance, and even blackmail if needed. After this, we found out from Andrews more about what her motive for trying to frame Matt on guard was. She reveals that Celeste and Pax and On Guard had dated previously, but he was kind of a jerk who never really cared about her and just threw her away. 
She then moved studios and met Juan Corda, and was truly happy. The two were going to get married until On Guard revealed the past relationship, causing Corda to break off the engagement. Afterwards, Impacts killed herself. So, with the game making it very clear that Matt On Guard is a great person who deserves to not go to prison, it's time for the final day of the trial. Alright, so first, Will Powers testifies, and his role in the case is basically to just prove that the killer was there, but by this point, basically everybody believes On Guard is guilty anyway, so who really cares? During a recess, Mia reports that she was channeled by Maya, and she saw a circus tent which means the poor police have to go back to the Berry Big Circus, everyone's favorite Ace Attorney location. After the recess, we finally find Impax a suicide note inside of a little puzzle there that this sus AF bellboy who totally wasn't a killer gave to someone. Upon further analysis, it was found that the note was written by Juan Corda, using handwriting analysis. Which, by the way, nowadays in real life it's considered a total pseudoscience. Finally, we get to hear testimony from the assassin himself. His main goal in his testimony is to say that Andrews was his client, but he fails tremendously, calling Adrian Andrews a man, despite claiming to have met her in real life, when she's actually a total queen. This pisses off the killer though, who says he's just gonna go and kill Maya anyway. On guard takes the stand to revel in his victory, and all looks lost until Francisca von Karma enters with some evidence that Gumshoe was supposed to bring but in typical gumshoe fashion he'd gotten into a car accident. Using this evidence, Phoenix is able to prove that on guard recorded the assassin killing Juan Corda, which is a big no-no. Facing either prison time or certain death at the hands of the killer, if set free, on guard chose prison time. We win! And everyone goes home happy. Except Matt on guard, and probably Shelly the killer. Now that we're done with the summary, I'm going to give my short thoughts on the three debuting characters we get before we move on. On Guard is the main villain of this case, obviously. The killer carried out the murder, but On Guard had the motive and the money to make it happen. His character twist has played out pretty well, as it flips the typical Ace Attorney format on its head. In every case before this, and most after it, the player will trust their client 100%, and they likely do On Guard here. Tell me. Did you actually guess this twist before it happened? It's absolutely one of the best Ace Attorney twists in my opinion. Just look at Bridge to the Turnabout for example, spoilers. Most of us figured out that Gato was probably the killer in this case, far before Nick found out. As for his evil character, he's kind of comically evil. Like the writers made absolutely sure that nobody's gonna actually like this dude after the twist. He taunts the player, and seems proud of what he's done and how he's going to get away with it. And he has no regard for anyone but himself. He uses everyone around him, even people who help him. He's kind of like the male version of Dahlia Hawthorne to be honest. He's an incredibly manipulative person, shown by how he even manipulates Phoenix Wright, who honestly has a pretty decent BS detector, and literal supernatural powers. But his personality flaws are ultimately his downfall. He's super paranoid, likely because he's worried about his image, which led to him recording D-Killer for blackmail. If he hadn't done that, then he'd be a free man and Adrian Andrews would be in prison. This is why On Guard is one of the best villains Ace Attorney's ever had. His own mistakes are what brought him down. Alright, so D-Killer isn't as fleshed out as either of the other two debuting characters here, but that's sort of the point. He's an assassin, he's not supposed to stick out. I mean, the dude appears a few times after this, and no one even notices it's him. He's a straight to the point sort of guy, but he has standards. Professionals have standards. And these standards are what lead to the downfall of Matt on guard. If you don't betray his trust, then he'll do everything to carry out the contract you gave him, shown by his willingness to kidnap Maya to help on guard go free. Adrian Andrews is underrated as hell. For a game written in Japan in the early 2000s, they actually do a pretty decent job when it comes to writing about her depression and other mental health issues. See, obviously she's flawed, but she's clearly still a good person. A good person in a bad headspace. If she were not... ill, she wouldn't have tampered with the crime scene. Look at how much better she is in the next game. In this case, she's very self-loathing, and clearly becomes attached to people, namely women, a bit too easily. I'm like 70% sure that she's a closeted lesbian icon. 
After her mentor's death, she became very cold and even tried to kill herself. Probably numb to the world. She's definitely not over the grief of it by the time this case rolls around. She's still very hateful to both of the men that her impacts. She even says as much, calling them hideous monsters. Now, by the end of the case, she's clearly beginning to turn a corner. Getting the two men that hurt her out of her life and leaving the entertainment industry did wonders. Andrews played her role as a fake-out killer so well. In order for the twist to work, she needed to be written well and believably, and she absolutely was. Everything about this case was routine until we break on guard's psycho locks, and the team at Capcom did that intentionally. Would this case be nearly as good if she wasn't written so well? Totally not. This case inarguably has one thing on almost every single other case in the series. Stakes. This is the first time there's such a serious consequence if things go wrong. Lose the case, and your partner fucking dies. That's just insane. You feel like you're walking on a tightrope most of the time, with a pit of fire below. As far as epicness and scope go, it's a pretty typical finale for Ace Attorney. All the beloved characters get together to help solve the mystery. But the one thing that makes this different from the other finales in this series is the feeling it invokes from the player. Goodbyes makes you feel suffocated. Bridge makes you feel hype. Turnabout succession makes you feel confused, and so on. But for well, my turnabout makes you feel scared and pressured. You can also get a bad ending if you screw up in the end. And probably the most famous moment from this game, the localization makes a hilarious typo in the middle of the sad bad ending. I'll also applaud this case's ability to succinctly fit in an entire self-contained plot within just one case. Just about everything is so neatly wrapped up nicely within it. Adrian Andrews, for example, could have literally never appeared again and I'd be fine with it. She had a nice little arc alone within this case. The mystery is tight and not too difficult to solve, and there aren't any glaring plot holes, which happens more often than you think in this series. Phoenix gets a ton of development as well in this case. This is the first case that really makes him question his role as a lawyer. Before this, it was always about getting the not guilty verdict, and catching the real killer. But here, he spends a majority of the case trying to get someone put into prison who's innocent. Even by the last trial, when he knows that Andrews is innocent, he's still desperately trying to convince people of her guilt. If not to put her in prison, it's to buy Maya more time so she can be found safely. It also uses Mia minimally in this case compared to most others before it. This shows a ton of growth from Nick. I also enjoy the way this case uses returning characters. They're there to reward the player for playing the previous game. Will Powers, Lotta Hart, and Old Bag don't overstay their welcome, and Edgeworth is great to have back after having to deal with Avon Karma for four cases in a row. If you're not counting Rise from the Ashes, that is. Another thing I quite enjoy are the cuts to Maya. They constantly remind the player of what's at stake, and they also give Maya some more characterization as you're hearing her thoughts directly instead of Nick's constantly. Maya as a whole stars in this case despite not being in it, really. You really learn how strong she is, which will make later moments in the series make just that much more sense. It's easy to forget all this girl had already been through at this point in the series. Her smarts and abilities are what lead her to being rescued in the first place. She manages to channel Mia while being tired, afraid, dehydrated, and malnourished. One game ago, she couldn't even channel her on command at all. Another thing I haven't seen a lot of people mention is this case's parallels to turn about goodbyes. In goodbyes, and in really the entire first game, you see Phoenix helping Edgeworth through a dark time, and he helps him understand what being a prosecutor is really about. In this case, you see Edgeworth helping Phoenix through a dark time, and he helps him find out what the purpose of a defense lawyer really is. This parallel is just the cherry on top of a great case. Farewell My Turnabout is one of the best chapters in any video game I've ever played. I hope that after this video you agree. The writing is near perfect, and its use of what the games did before it to subvert expectations is perfect. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.